There are all kinds of different people in the world, aren't there? Uh, all kinds of different personalities. And uh, I know that because right here we're different, aren't we? <laughs> we? We're all different. We've got lots of different uh, ways that we do things and so forth. But just considering a couple of things. Uh, some people, for instance, are loners. They, they like to be alone. Uh, they, if they, to them, the perfect vacation would be to go by themselves somewhere where no one else is, where no one uh, recognizes them. Maybe they're hiking up in the woods or something. Uh, and, and some people are just that way, and that's okay. I would imagine some of you kind of like your alone time and so forth. Uh, there's some people <clears throat> who, when they are doing something like that, they, they want activity. They want to be surrounded by lots of people. Uh, the bigger the event, the better, and, and, and they just I love that kind of stuff. I would think, though, that most of us are somewhere in the middle there, right? We're not quite the loner. We're not quite needing the activities. In fact, if you're kind of like me, I kind of need both from time to time, right? Sometimes I want to be alone or just with my family. Sometimes I want to be with, with a large group doing fun things. But there's lots of different types of things. Well, I wonder how the Apostle Paul was. I wonder how he... Uh, looked at this whole thing. Would he rather be alone? Would he rather be in a group? Uh, I, I think, again, like most of us, he's somewhere in the middle. But Paul did appreciate having uh, fellow believers around him. And today, we're going to look at some of the names we're going to look at. It's going to be all be males. <coughs> but you need to know that that's not exclusive. There were plenty of females that were involved in Paul's ministry as well. Remember um, uh, Ananias? Not Ananias and Sapphira, wrong group. What's the name of the couple? Um, what? Priscilla. Priscilla and Aquila was who I was thinking of. But yeah, you mentioned Lydia, Timothy, Timothy's the grandmother. Uh, I think one of the names of Lois. Where's, where's Lo uh, Lois and you? Is, it, where, is Lois here? She was here. Oh, I was going to ask her if she was Timothy's grandmother. But, but I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure she was. She'd get a kick out of that if she was here, by the way. But, but there's plenty of other. When he wrote the letter to the Romans, he sent it by a lady named Phoebe. And he referred to her as a great servant of the church and, and so forth. So there were plenty of other ladies. So please, don't be offended by that. That's not the point today. I'm going to look at a particular group here that Paul was involved in. And, and us just think through the idea of how their companionship uh, helped him. Uh, helped him in feeling secure, helped him in sensing that uh, brotherliness of locking arms together and moving forward, uh, and, and all the other things that uh, fellowship provides. And of course, what I eventually want us to do is to apply it toward ourselves. How important is our fellowship? How important is it that we are a part of each other? How important is it that, that we're involved in, in each other's lives? And, and that's what we'll eventually get to as we do that. So keep that in mind. As we do that, I'm going to start reading in Acts chapter 20, but let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Father, we thank you that as you created the world and as you created uh, mankind, uh, you gave us uh, this uh, propensity to need fellowship, to need other people in our lives. Even those of us who want to be loners still need other people, and we don't want to be in solitary confinement. And uh, we thank you, Father, for the way that our brothers and sisters in Christ add to our lives. And help us to see this today, how these folks added to Paul's life and ministry, but also how it applies to us. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin reading in Acts chapter 20. I want to look at verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, that was the riot in Ephesus, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. By the way, when you see the word us, uh, Luke is starting to refer to himself, because he's the one who's writing the book here in Acts. Uh, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Well, I want us to just stop and think about this uh, for a minute. 
uh, and think about these people who are traveling with him. But as we do that, let's get a little bit of, of our bearings. Let's look at some of the context. Paul is actually on his third missionary journey. If you're in Acts 20, just turn back a page or two to Acts uh, 18. And I want to look at verse 23. He had just returned from his second missionary journey, and he had visited the church and gave a report of that. And it says in verse uh, 23, After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. This is the beginning of his third missionary journey. And it says that he was visiting the established churches. That's where he had already planted churches. His first missionary journey, he went up into what we would call Galatia and Asia Minor. And he had, he had started several churches there. And then his second missionary journey, he went kind of through that region, but then went on over into Macedonia, where you find uh, uh, the Thessalon Thessalonica and also uh, Corinth and, and Athens. You find those towns over there. He went through there. Well, so Paul wanted to go through all these places, again, strengthening the churches and helping to uh, make stronger disciples. So he was going teaching. That's what he was doing. He was giving them more biblical instruction, uh, helping them to learn. If you have to remember, a lot of these were churches. They were never churches before. They, they needed to know more about what does God expect from us as churches. Uh, even things as simple as how are we to be organized? How, how should our church operate? And, and how should we carry out business? That kind of a thing. And then how should we live in light of all the circumstances we see around us? And they were living in a pretty rotten society. They were living in, in a society that was involved with uh, a lots of temple worship and idol worship and all the things that that led to, all of that. There was gross immorality. I mean, you think America's bad, and America does have its flaws, but this is every bit as bad, if not worse, uh, where they were. So Paul's going around teaching the disciples how to live in light of those things and how to, how to be the type of disciples that Jesus wants in his church. Well, that's what he was doing. And as he was going and doing that, he made a decision that he needed to go back to Jerusalem. And when he went back to Jerusalem, he wanted to bring uh, an offering from the Gentile churches back to Jerusalem because the believers back in Jerusalem were under heavy persecution. You know, if you turn to Christ... The Jews there, they didn't want you. They, they, they would put you out of work. They would, they would uh, uh, do all kinds of things that would make life just difficult for you. And so the believers back in Jerusalem were, were struggling financially and in lots of other ways. And so Paul wanted to bring an offering from all of these Gentile churches. And again, he's going over this whole area where he had been with, uh, with his disciples, or, or establishing these churches. And he's having them get an offering. Let me give you an example. While he was on this journey, he wrote uh, to the church in Rome. And let me turn to that. Romans chapter 15. Let me just read a couple of verses to you. Verses 25 through 27. Paul said to them, But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a, a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles had been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed, sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. So he's telling the Romans, I'm going to work my way back there, and these churches that I've just been in, they've been taking up an offering, and they want to send it back to the people in Jerusalem. Now, I want to turn to another place. This is in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, where Paul mentions the same idea of what he's doing. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, let me begin reading at verse 1. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So you, you get what he's just saying? He says, if, if I'm going to have you appoint some men from your church that are going to go and carry this gift. And, and think about the wisdom of that, first of all. There's, there's a, a fiscal accountability. Uh, instead of them just handing the money to Paul and Paul leaving town... Who knows what he would do with the money? He could have spent it however he wanted. And in fact, that's what some of the false teachers that traveled around the world in those days were doing. 
They were raising all kinds of funds and then just spending it on themselves. You know, if it would be like some we know today, they'd be buying a private jet with it so they can fly wherever they want to minister or, or do all this. But no, Paul says, no, you're going to appoint some men, and they're going to take that, that money, and they'll go. And if I need to go with them, I will. And we know later that Paul did uh, end up going with them. But that's where we get the idea of these people, these men, that are going to travel with him as he goes. Now, uh, this is going to be companionship in difficult times. We, we read this, these verses already in Acts chapter 20. And uh, let me go back to that passage. In uh, Acts chapter 20, if you were to read the chapters before that, you'll see that they just went through some difficult times. There was uh, this riot in Ephesus, and they wanted to kill Paul. Paul. Paul and his group had been preaching the gospel. People were getting saved. Well, why would they hate that? Well, follow the money, and you'll see why. There, there were silversmiths there uh, where he was preaching, and they were finding out that this was cutting into their business because those silversmiths made idols. And as more and more people got saved, they quit buying the idols. And they recognized, look, we make money off of this. And this is a bad deal. So they, they, they whipped the people up. Of course, they didn't whip them up about money. But these craftsmen whipped the people up and said, look, that we're, we have the temple of Diana. She's a great Diana. Of course, everybody got all upset. And, and they're rushing around. They're, they're, it actually says that they were so confused, a lot of the people in the mob didn't even know why they were there. They just knew that they're shouting about their Diana. You know? And uh, they grabbed a couple people. In fact, a couple of the guys that we're going to hear their names in, in just a minute were some that were grabbed. And they were like this close to being killed by a mob. And they were the ones that were traveling with Paul. Paul wanted to go into where they were. They went into one of the large theaters there. And Paul wanted to go in, but everybody was holding back, saying, no, don't go, don't go, because they, they would have wanted to kill you. And so forth. So they had that. Well, then now, as they leave, and as chapter 20 begins, it says there's another plot. They were plotting to kill him. I think this time it was the Jews. They wanted to kill him as he set sail. And, and he knew all that. And these men that were with him, they were in danger of all of those things. So as Paul is traveling, these guys were giving him companionship in the middle of all these things. Well, who are these guys? I want us to look at that. We already read their names in Acts chapter 6, but Bob's going to put a map up here. I know not all of you are, are into maps, maybe. I, I love maps. But this will kind of give you an idea of where they came from. You probably can't see a lot of it, but here, I'll do this. This is uh, Jerusalem right here, and this would be uh, Israel. And you go up around this part of the world, this is the Mediterranean Sea, but you go around this way, and it takes you more over into Europe and so forth. But uh, you've got all these regions. Maybe you've read some of these regions in the Bible. You've read of Cilicia, and Cappadocia, and Pamphylia. Maybe those names ring a bell to you. You've read over time. Here is Galatia. Galatia is not a city. It's a region. And here's what they call Asia. Now, when we think of Asia, we think of China or Japan and all that. But... In this part of the world, that was Asia. I think it may have even been referred to as Asia Minor at, at some point. But this is, this is Asia, and that's where, in fact, all of the churches that the letters to uh, in Revelation were written to are all in Asia. The seven churches in uh, Revelation that received those letters. And then when he crossed over into Macedonia, that's where he had that vision where the person was saying, come over here and help us. They crossed the sea here, went into Macedonia. There's Philippi, there's Thessalonica. Uh, down here is Corinth, and then there's Athens. So you can see that part of the world. Well, I want to leave that up for a couple of minutes because it's going to tell you where all these guys came from. And they came from places where Paul started churches. And these churches were now giving so that they could go back and minister to the poor saints in Jerusalem. Let me just say this for a minute. They weren't giving to the poor. They were giving to the poor saints. And most of the time when you see in the scriptures that they're giving to the poor, uh, they're giving to the poor saints. They weren't trying to alleviate world poverty. And I'm not saying that's a bad goal at all, but don't let anyone tell you that that's what we as a church are supposed to do. They were taking care of the family of God, and they were sending it to that. Uh, Paul read a passage today in, in Sunday school about where Jesus said, uh, all of you who have done these things to the least of these, my brethren, you know, like giving me a cup of cold water, visited me in jail, and done all that, and, uh, and then he got onto the group that didn't do any of those things. He wasn't talking about serving the poor. He was talking about serving believers. There were believers who were poor and believers who needed help. And you were either helping them or you were persecuting them, which is what the second group did. 
So again, don't let anyone tell you that if you're not feeding the poor, you're not doing Jesus' work. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible, when it's talking about, here's an example of them helping the poor of the saints, that is, the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. I Forgive me for going on to that, but that's kind of a pet peeve of mine, I, and, and we just need to keep that in mind. That doesn't mean that we can't do things to help people who are poor, help people who need food items and stuff like that. We can do those, but never make it the major aim of what our church is. No. Uh, they were here helping fellow believers. Well, anyway, let's look at some of these names. Let me grab this here, and I'll back up as I look at some of these. Uh, the people that he lists in Acts chapter 20, I want to think it's verse 3 and 4. First of all, he mentions uh, several of these who are from Macedonia. That's this area over here. And he mentions there's Berea, and then there's Thessalonica. He mentions Sopater of Berea, and he mentions Aristarchus of the Thessalonians, and Secundus who are from the Thessalonians. Again, they were from these two cities here, these churches, and they were going with Paul on this ministry, helping him with that. And then he mentioned some people who were from Galatia. Well, over here's Galatia, and he says southern Galatia, so like there's the city of Derby, for instance, and there's Lystra, right there. Well, he mentions uh, Gaius of Derby. And by the way, when you see the name Gaius in the scriptures, that was a common name. It's about like someone being called Bill, or being called Bob. Uh, it, 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 it's, a common, it's a common name, and I'm not saying that's bad, Bob, but, it, but it's a common name. And just because you hear the name doesn't mean it's the same person. Well, there's probably at least four different people mentioned in the Bible whose names were Gaius. And they're, they're different individuals, but here's one of them. And uh, he was from, it says he was from um, uh, southern Galatia, so that's uh, Gaius. And then Timothy was from right here as well. He was in that area. Uh, then it mentions people who were from Ephesus, and they refer to as Asia. That's going to be over here. I think you see right there is Ephesus. And uh, that's where these guys were from. He mentioned uh, Tychicus and Trophimus, both of Asia. And they were right around that area of Asia. All right, Bob, you can go back to the, the next screen again. Um, but then he mentions Luke. And Luke was traveling with him. Or maybe I should say Luke mentions himself as he's uh, writing this particular story. And there were other people that traveled with him as well. And so there were several that were involved in this group. But these particular people, I think we've got seven different names given here of people who were messengers from the churches. And they were traveling along with their church's gift to go and minister to the saints back in, in Jerusalem. And these guys were all Gentiles. But they were going back to serve I, let, me, let me rephrase that. I guess I'm not positive. Some of them could be Jews that were from these areas, but we think they were, mo they were mostly Gentiles. And they were going back to do this. But they were traveling with Paul, and they were experiencing some of the things that Paul experienced. But imagine what they added to the group. Now, imagine what it was for this group to be together. Right? If, if you had to go on a long journey, and back then you were walking or riding a horse or, or riding on a ship, and wouldn't you like to have a group of fellow-minded people, like-minded people, and, and especially in this case, believers. That's what Paul had. He had these believers. Can you, can, do you think that they maybe joked around a little bit? Well, when we ever get together as a group, do we ever joke around? You know, think of the groups we've got here. We've got, I think of the ladies who are meeting next week, have their ladies' fellowship. They have a good time together. They joke around, too. Uh, they do some serious things as well. I know we've got uh, our men's group that goes to the men's retreat. We have a blast. Uh, with each other. And then we've got, I, I know there's been times that we've done church projects and a bunch of us will get together helping. I know some of you have helped uh, cut our wood um, the last couple of years actually at, at our house for our firewood. Uh, we've gotten together and put on some roofs on houses and, and we've enjoyed that time. It's, it's been a blast being together and helping. I remember when Carl Schreiner fell off of Rich Savola's house off the top. I was by him one minute, he's down here, I turn, I go like this and all of a sudden there's nothing. I thought the rapture happened. <laughs> Only I was stymied. Why did Carl go and not me? I, mean, I, I couldn't figure that. But no, Carl had missed a space with his knee and fell off. And he ended up breaking some ribs, didn't you, Carl? Yeah, you know. And, and, and I mean, so we've had, we've had some dangerous things. Thankfully, we haven't had a, a lot of other more uh, tragic things that are going on as far as our groups getting together and so forth. But... Those, man, it's good fellowship. You encourage each other. We need each other. And, and that's what Paul was getting by them. They were doing a couple things. They, of course, were bringing financial help to the saints in Jerusalem. Uh, I believe it was a symbol of the worldwide growth of the church. 
As the church was growing, these guys were all from these different churches, and they weren't the only churches. There were other churches that could have sent people, but these were the ones that were sent. And, and the churches are growing. They're, they're spreading out into the rest of the world beyond Israel. Just like, just like they were told in Acts 1.8, or they would go from, from Jerusalem to Judea to uh, other parts of the world, Samaria, and unto the utter ends of the earth. Well, the church was doing that. And as this group travels together, they were representing that. There were also some practical matters that they did. Not only did they help each other, not only did they probably share food. I mean, I, I would imagine Secundus' mother was a really good cookie baker, and he had lots of cookies in his pouch, and, you know, they enjoyed that stuff. But they also helped protect each other. Because in those days, there were robbers that would wait. If Paul and Timothy were traveling, just the two of them, they could have gotten robbed. And this was probably a sizable gift that they were delivering. They could have been robbed, but now they're in a larger group. And that provided safety. So they were certainly helping one another. I, I think this would have been a wonderful group to be around. H have any of you seen... There's one TV show, and, and I don't get the channel that it's on, but it's The Chosen. I think it's about Jesus, and it's showing where he and his disciples are traveling around. Have any of you seen some of that of late? I've seen a few pieces of it. It looks like maybe not many of you are or have seen it. But what I really enjoyed about the few that I saw was it showed the dynamic within the group of the 12 disciples. And it was more than just the 12 disciples. There was a large group of people that traveled around with Jesus. But it showed how they interacted with each other, how they helped each other, how they, they confronted one another, how they uh, helped give each other the energy to keep moving forward, that kind of a thing. Well, I think you would see that with this group of these guys that were traveling with Paul. And in all of Paul's letters, he mentions other people that are with him, other people that were helping. It, it was an important thing. Companionship is designed by the Lord. So that we would have that. In fact, I want to take a few minutes and look at the idea of companionship within the scriptures. We need people. And the scriptures make that abundantly clear that we need people. We're never meant to go it alone. I, and that's why the church is here, as a matter of fact. But before we uh, get into the church idea, turn to the book of Proverbs, if you would. Proverbs. It's about in the middle of your Bible. The book of Psalms is generally in the middle, and Proverbs is just after Psalms. But I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter 12. And I'm going to skip ahead to a couple other uh, chapters as we go. But in uh, Proverbs chapter 12, just think of the idea that, first of all, friends are important, but you need to be careful. You need to choose them wisely. Uh, verse 25 and 26 of chapter 12. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Verse 26. The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. You see, you got to be careful. You got to make sure you've got the right friends and so forth. Uh, I remember talking to a fellow that um, he, he really struggled in his faith, struggled in his Christianity, and he talked about how much better it was at the bars. When he'd go to the bars and all these people loved him, all these people were kind to him. Well, I, I get that. People can be friends. I think friendship is put within us when God created all of us, not just saved, but unsaved as well. So, yeah, there can be types of friendship. But what kind of counsel is he getting? What kind of godly advice is, is he getting? What kind of things is he being told to do or to think that are the way God wants him to do and think? And he's probably not finding it there. You know? It's the same idea of a person going to a bar to find a spouse. Are, are you sure you're going to get someone that's going to be the wisest person for you to be with? And so forth. All that is there. Well, then you go to chapter 13, verse 20. And it says, He who walks with wise men will be wise. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. We've got to be careful. Make sure we're choosing wise people. Yes, we need to befriend unsaved people. Yes, we need to befriend people who are claimed to be saved but maybe aren't walking right. We need to be friends with them. But who are going to be our primary companions? You've got to be careful about that. Uh, let's go a little bit uh, more. Uh, go to chapter 17 now of Proverbs. And this is the idea that God gives us friends and companions to help us enjoy life, uh, to, to experience the joys of life, and to even be there when we need them when we're going through troubled times as well. Uh, Proverbs 17, verse 17 says, A friend loves at all time, and a brother is born for adversity. 
I know most of you think that, yeah, my brother was a real adversity for me to have to live with. I don't think that's exactly what the, what the author is getting at. I think he's saying when you are going through troubles, you have family that can help you. I, th I think that's really more the emphasis. But a friend loves at all times. And then I want to go on to chapter 27 and kind of keep on that same idea. Chapter 27, verse 10. It says, do not forsake your own friend or your father's friend. And then it says, nor go to your brother's house in the day of calamity. Better is a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. Now, there's a couple things for you to chew on there. Um, not saying that you can't go to family where there is adversity, like the verse we just looked at was kind of uh, pointing toward. But what it's saying is if you've got friends around you, they're as good as family. They're, they're, they are family. That they will help you with those things. It'd be better to have a friend that lives next door than to think about your family that lives three states away. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you need to have friends because they help you. You can't always just pack up and go to your, your family that's way away. When we lived in Hawaii, we experienced that. I think that's why our church was so close. We, we had a, a good church there that were, where there was a lot of love uh, within the group. And it's because most everyone that was there was there with the military. And none of them had family on the island. All their families back on the mainland, a couple thousand miles away and a lot of money away to try to buy a ticket and go visit them. So when you went through hardships, you had to rely on your friends. You had to rely on, on that. And that's why being a part of a church was so important, because you had that family to be a part of. And, and I believe that's what the writer of, of Proverbs is trying to say here. You need friends to help you in those difficulties. And then while we're in chapter 27, there's a couple other verses that talk about uh, friendship and how it adds good things to our lives. Uh, 27 verse 6. He who, let's see, let me get in the correct chapter. Um, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Uh, sometimes you have a friend that may have to approach you, may have to let you know, you know what, you were wrong back there. And you need to listen to that, because that's far better than, than someone who's not really on your side that's patting you on the back saying you did, you did great. You need to listen to your friends sometimes, even if they have to uh, step on your toes once in a while. And then go down to verse 9. Ointment and perfume delight the heart, and the sweetness of a man's friend gives delight by hearty counsel. We need each other. Go to verse 17 of chapter 27. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Uh, we need friendship. We need that. We, we need them who are around us. And God recognizes it. The Holy Spirit, as he inspires the scriptures, obviously recognizes it. Because you see a lot of these passages that tell you that. And by the way, Proverbs is wisdom literature. God's trying to give us more wisdom by telling us these things. Uh, we need friendship. We need companionship. Uh, think about the, the most intimate of companionship that you have, and that would be your, your spouse. Uh, marriage is, is a wonderful example of that, that type of friendship. Have you ever asked yourself, what's the purpose of marriage? Is the purpose of marriage to have children? Well, that's one of the things that happens from marriage, but the Bible never says that's the purpose. Is the purpose of marriage to legitimize our, our fleshly desires? Well, it does help in that area, but no, that's not what it's talking about. If you were to go back, and we won't do that today, but if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, and it talks about when God created a wife for Adam, what did he say? Genesis chapter 2 says that God saw man and said, it is not good that man is alone. I'm going to make him a helper uh, fit for him. And, and so the whole purpose of marriage... From right from the very beginning is companionship. Companionship is extremely important for us. Yes, we have it in the closest relationship, that of our, our marriage and our, our family, but we need it beyond that as well. We need everybody else. And, and that brings us to the idea of the church. How important is the church in our lives? I believe we must be a part of the church. Turn back in the New Testament to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews would be after Colossians where we were. But I want to look at Hebrews chapter 10. And this is, this is pointing out the importance of being a part of a spiritual family, the church. We, we need to be a part of that. Hebrews chapter 10. I want to begin reading verse 24. It says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love 
and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day would be when the Lord is going to return, the end times and so forth. But don't forsake assembling together. We need to be a part of a church. It's important. We need to be there to encourage one another, to stir up love, and to stir up good works. Uh, we need each other, and, and that's what I believe is one of the main purposes of the church. Yes, we're Christ's body. Yes, we're bringing the gospel to the world, all of that. But while we're bringing the gospel to the world, we have each other. We need to be a part of each other. We need to be taking care of each other. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, you don't have to turn there, but Paul's talking about how we as a group of people get together, and he says there, as he's describing the, the uh, idea of, the, of we being a body, he says, you know, there's lots of different parts that make up a body, so we're not all the same. He said, the foot can't say to the hand, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body. And the hand can't say, well, because I'm not a foot, I'm not part of it. No, we're all part of it. We're all different. We've got those different personalities. We've got those different uh, uh, gifts that we can use to serve the Lord. Uh, we're all different. We've got different viewpoints, which we need. Uh, we have all of that. And that's what church, uh, Paul is getting at there in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. Uh, he also says in Galatians 6, verse 2, a verse that we're all familiar with, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And the context of that verse is when you see a brother sinning, you need to be willing to talk to them about it. That's how you bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. But, but it's important. You can't do that by yourself. You know, it's not enough to listen to a sermon. Especially now with the whole uh, pandemic when it came upon us and, and all these churches are posting their services online. We, we, we have been. Uh, now, now that the pandemic's over, we've been just posting the sermons. But it's not enough to sit there and watch a service. Because it's not about being at a service. It's not about just singing songs. It's not about just hearing someone teach the scriptures. All those things are good. All those things are helpful. But we are designed to be a part of a group and to be there with each other and to be rubbing shoulders with each other. All the things we talked about uh, back in, in Proverbs. Um, how, how can iron sharpen iron when they're watching each other on TV? It can't. They got to be together and they got to strike and, and, and go back and forth and, and sharpen each other. That's how it works. Uh, we need one another. We need to be able to do those things. Uh, the last passage I want to look at is back in Colossians, since we've been going through Colossians. I want to go back to Colossians chapter 3, and Paul is going to talk about this idea to them, and we'll look at it in more detail later, but it's the idea that we need to fellowship together, but how do you fellowship together? By the way, does the Bible say that we as brothers and sisters in Christ we're going to get together and it's going to be just one big love fest? Everything's going to be wonderful. Look, if you're all living for Jesus, everything should be good, right? Actually, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible gives the idea that there are going to be problems. You know, as I look around our group and I think of other people that are part of our group that aren't here today, uh, we're all different and not a single one of us is perfect. I mean, my wife is the closest one to it, of course. But, but none of us here are perfect. And we're going to rub each other wrong from time to time. We're going to say mean things, maybe inadvertently, maybe on purpose, once in a while to each other. How do we handle those things? Well, that's kind of what Paul's talking about here in Colossians 3. I want to begin in Colossians 3, uh, verse 12. He said, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Now, you might say, well, well, yeah, we need to do that, especially toward the world, right? Well, yeah, we do it toward the world. But keep reading verse 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Now, why would the Holy Spirit have Paul write that if there weren't going to be times when you had to use it? There are going to be times when we offend each other. There's going to be times when we're, we're saying things that we ought not to be saying. There's going to be times when I think I'm right and you think you're right, and obviously I am and you're wrong, and we're going to be mad about it, right? That, that's kind of how that's going to work. But we can't be, we can't be letting that uh, divide us. I want to keep reading verse 14. But above all these things, put on love 
which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, we need each other, but we need to be realists and realize that there's going to be difficulties from time to time. And you know, I quite often wonder, how many times have I said something up here that's offended some of you? And I know that's happened. I, I've had people come to me before and talk about something that offended them. Uh, maybe they were overly sensitive and it shouldn't have offended them. But sometimes they were right. I was not sensitive enough and I said something I shouldn't have said. I, I get that. Those things are going to happen. But that doesn't mean it's all over. That doesn't mean, well, I'm leaving this church and going to the next church. Because you know what happens? You go to the next church, it's going to happen there too. Because we're all sinners. We're, we're, we're working toward uh, being made holy, but we're not there yet. And we keep pressing forward. So we need to work together. We need to love each other. And that's how it is. Well, I wonder back to Paul's group and his companions, how sweet the fellowship was. I, I, I just, I wonder about that. Oh, did any of them ever do anything wrong? Probably. Secundus probably hoarded his cookies from his mom once in a while. I don't know if he had cookies, but boy, it sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, but some of these, uh, who knows? But they helped each other. They, they rubbed off the rough edges as they were sandpaper uh, with each other. They, 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 in, they helped keep each other safe. They helped watch out for each other. All, all of that stuff was happening. And, and I think it would have to have been a good fellowship. And they did it all while serving the Lord, bringing this gift to meet the needs of these saints in Jerusalem that were under persecution. So yes, it was a wonderful thing. Well, we like them. We need each other. We, we honestly do. Uh, and of course, have, being a part of the family begins at salvation. The first thing is that you need to make sure you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty that you rightly owed, but he paid it for you, and now God offers you forgiveness. Once you've done that, once you've received that forgiveness, uh, you're a part of the family. But then once you're a part of the family, it's not good enough to just be called a Christian and go on and do your own thing. You still need to be a part of the family. We have weekly family meetings. And we need, we need to be a part of that. I, God knows when we have times when we miss, and he knows that and understands it and so forth. But we, we need to be a part of each other. Uh, we, we need to be fellowshipping with each other. What did Jesus say to his disciples? They'll know you're my disciples if you love one another. And uh, what a good testimony. And we need that. You know, it's not about us just being careful that we, that we put the right reputation out to the world. God cares about you, and he cares about me, and he wants you to have your needs ministered to. That's why we're part of the family of God. And fellowship is an important biblical concept. It's just not just a good idea that someone had and thinks we need to fellowship. No, it's how God has designed it to be. And we need to be a part of that and be caring for each other. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for making us a part of this. Thank you, Lord, for creating this whole idea of, of fellowship and, and, and friendship and caring for each other and helping to meet needs with each other. Thank you for that. And I pray that you'd help each one of us to fully participate in that. Help us, Lord, to fully be a part of that and enjoy the benefits that you have designed us to have. And uh, I pray that, that, Lord, as we face uncertain times, that you'd help us to watch our testimonies. You'd help us to be careful to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. But, Father, help us to do it in one way that we certainly can, and that is by loving each other and other people seeing that and wanting to know the love of God as well. May we be a testimony in that way. I'm praying this in Jesus' name.